can join the conversation tonight online by tweeting with the hashtag ToleranceJFK, which is also listed in your program. As a reminder, National Voter Registration Day is coming up on September 22nd. If you are not registered to vote or need to change your registration address, we'd encourage you to visit our voter registration booth to my left, right in front of the IOP exit. The IOP is pleased to partner with TurboVote to help make it easy for everyone to vote. Tonight's event will begin shortly. Please take your seats now and enjoy the program. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. I'm Maggie Williams, Director of the Institute of Politics here at Harvard. And it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator, an individual who is truly a woman for all seasons. Government leader, crisis manager, terrorism expert, homeland security strategist, civil rights attorney, TV news analyst, newspaper columnist, Harvard faculty member and mom. Juliet oh, Kayyem. <laughs> Not running for governor. <laughs> Juliet Kayyem is all of these and more. Juliet began her career at the US Department of Justice where she was a trial attorney in the Civil Rights Division before becoming legal advisor to Attorney General Janet Reno. She served on the National Commission on Terrorism before joining the administration of Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick as the, first, as the state's first Undersecretary under for Homeland Security. More recently, Juliet was President Obama's Assistant Secretary for Intergovernmental Affairs at the Department of Homeland Security. She is a columnist for the Boston Globe, an on-air security analyst for CNN and other television and radio networks, She's also, she also hosts a bi-weekly podcast called Security Mom. We are most fortunate to have her as a faculty member here at the Kennedy School and as a member of the Belfer Center's Board of Directors. I am delighted to present Juliet Kayyem, our moderator for the evening. Thank you, Juliet. Thank you. Thank you so much. I have to say, I'm no longer a columnist for the Boston Globe, and my producer at WGBH would be mad if I didn't correct it. So um, I want to thank you all for coming, and Maggie, thank you. So you all are in, uh, in store for an enlightening and respectful evening. I know this because I've had the pleasure of reading this book by Sam Harris and Maja Nuwaz, uh, entitled Islam and the Future of Tolerance. You'll be able to buy it in about two weeks. Its subtitle, A Dialogue, uh, lives up to its promise. In it, Sam and Majid ask basic but difficult questions about Islam, reform, and extremism. It is uncomfortable at times, but always thought-provoking. And its premise, if we cannot speak about a dominant religion in the world and a guiding force for so many in ways that are critical, compassionate, and maybe to some even offensive, then we will not advance our common understanding or create a different narrative than the one that dominates discussions of Islam today. It is an intimate conversation, stemming from a dinner talk between the two of them in which Harris challenged the base, basic premise of Nawaz's thesis by asking, how can you say Islam is a religion of peace? And instead of that ending the conversation, each going to opposite sides of the ring, leading the dialogue to others who are more extreme in their views, they actually search for common answers or at least a common premise. Tonight, for the first time, these leading public intellectuals and scholars take that dialogue and come to the forum. Their basic bios are well known. Maj Majid Nawaz is the author of Radical and co-founder and chairman of Killiam, a think tank focused on religious freedom and extremism. He is one of the world's leading scholars and activists for a reform movement led by and for Muslims. Sam Harris is the author of The End of Faith and a Letter to a Christian Nation, among others. A neuroscientist and philosopher, he is the co-founder and chief executive of Project Reason, a nonprofit or organization that promotes science and secularism, and also hosts a podcast called Waking Up with Sam Harris. Yes, I'm sitting here with a famous atheist and a former radical. 
My role here is unique. In prepping, I sort of felt like I was asking my daughter if she would mind me being the high school dance chaperone, and she would reply, rightfully, I'm fine on my own. In their, in their book, these two just do fine without a moderator. But this forum isn't just about a book. It is about how two people with very different views of religion, and one religion in particular, engage on a very polarizing issue. So I hope that to interject a third participant in a dialogue that turns out, uh, in a dialogue turns in, into what it should be, a conversation that engages us all. Forum moderators here at the Kennedy School have a tendency to sit in the role of asking the panelists, so tell me how great you are, and then tell me again. That isn't what tonight is about. I will play the skeptic and the provocateur. It is a waste of your time and theirs uh, to play platitudes. On this issue, time is of the essence. So some ground rules. Freedom of speech and civil discourse are bedrock principles at the Kennedy School, the Forum, the University, and our democracy. With that in mind, I would ask the audience members to refrain from interrupting tonight's forum. While I understand that many of you may have a difference of opinion with one or both of them, I would ask that you respect our speaker's freedom to speech, uh, right to free speech, as well as the rights of the audience members to listen to tonight's speaker. More importantly, there will be an opportunity to ask the speaker any question during the question and answer session. So with those ground rules, I'm gonna start with uh, Majid. Thank you, and I have to say, I'm pronouncing your, na your name differently because you told me how it was pronounced and I'm now forgetting. I think your pursuit, I know what it is, it is uh, Majid, thank you, your pursuit within your Islamic faith uh, to counter an extremist narrative. It's what you do for a living, it is what you write about. Seems to me a central cause given the times today and is essential given the world we're living in right now. And you came to this mission from a very personal place and I think it's important for audience members to describe that place briefly so that they know where you're coming from. Yes, thank you, Juliet, and it's a pleasure and an honor to be here at Harvard, uh, and thank you to Harvard and to Harvard University Press for making all of this possible. Um, in terms of the name, uh, the easiest way to remember <laughs> it is just think of magic and put a D on the end. Okay, we got it. Um, and uh, I, I blame Larry King. Uh, one of the last <laughs> episodes he ever did was an interview with me, and uh, he perverted the name to such an extent, you can watch it on YouTube, he called me Majid Nawaz. Uh, which isn't my name whatsoever, but it's Majid Nawaz, uh, and thank you for that kind introduction. I called you Majid for about a month on my podcast, and never, I will never hear the end of it. <laughs> yeah. um, Majid is also a name, but it's just not my name. It's like Sarah and Sarah. The, the uh, thing about my background in, in very succinct form, because of course it's something you can read on uh, uh, online, but I, I joined a, a radical Islamist group at the age of 16 years old uh, due to many, many factors, which I won't repeat here. And that led to a, a journey for me. I ended up on the leadership of this organization. Um, uh, this organization known as Hezbo Tahrir believes, it still does believe, it's still around, uh, believes in resurrecting a theocratic caliphate and forcibly annexing Muslim majority states uh, to under its writ uh, and then expanding to a point where via offensive jihad in their own terms, they conquer the rest of the world. Uh, the method to come to power for this organization is via military coups. They succeeded in many instances in inciting military coups in various Muslim majority uh, countries, including Pakistan, my country of origin, uh, the last of which was a couple of years ago where uh, the Pakistani government announced that Brigadier Ali Khan had been arrested along with a few other plotters uh, for being affiliated with Hizb Tahrir. They are very serious about coming to power via military coups, um, and they were the first organization to popularize the notion that in this modern day and age, Muslims such as myself must dedicate our cause uh, our life's energies to resurrecting a theocratic caliphate. I joined this group at 16. I ended up on their leadership committee. I ended up being one of the first British Pakistani members to export the organization from Britain to Pakistan. Yes, that's correct. Uh, Britain is a net exporter of extremism. Um, it went that way around, not the other way around. Um, though, of course, Pakistan has produced its own fair share of Taliban and other such groups. Um, from Pakistan, I then went from, uh, from there back to the UK and ended up every weekend flying to Denmark to set up the Danish-Pakistani chapter. And eventually, uh, one day before the 9-11 attacks, I arrived in Egypt, where I continued to uh, attempt to recruit people to this cause. And uh, in, in roughly 10 months after 9-11, uh, 
uh, my activities caught up with me and the Egyptian regime uh, arrested me uh, along with hundred, hundreds of others, uh, Egyptians and a few other Brits. Uh, they uh, eventually, after a stint in their torture dungeons uh, and after roughly four months in solitary confinement, they eventually charged us. We were charged and then convicted for believing in ideas and belonging to a banned organization, at which point Amnesty International adopted us as prisoners of conscience. And uh, from there, fast forward to completing my sentence. I, I wasn't released early, I had to complete my sentence. When I returned to the UK in 2006, um, after a period of what I have come to describe as the jihadist equivalent of living in George Orwell's animal farm, I reevaluated my perspective and my understanding uh, and decided to critique the Islamist ideology while remaining a Muslim and set up Quilliam uh, as an organization to do that critiquing and that's what led me to, to this stage here today and in dialogue with Sam. Thank you, Sam. You came to this dialogue obviously from a very different place. Your work has focused on the new atheism and a belief that we should be at liberty to criticize religions. In that regard, to make clear, your critiques of Islam really are in a tradition of your scholarship overall. But I think it would be helpful to, des uh, to describe to people where you know, your intellectual enterprise and how you came to this conversation. Uh, yeah, well, um, first, thank you again to Harvard University Press and Harvard itself. Uh, and thank you, Juliet, for moderating. When I read Juliet's bio before this event, I just thought that Majid and I should be asking her questions. So. <laughs> You uh, go back and read her bio if you ignored the, the preamble because uh, it's very impressive. Um, so yeah, I had been studying philosophy and um, really re I've been kind of self-taught in religion for the decade of my 20s. I was very interested in religion and spiritual experience. I spent a lot of time in India and Nepal studying meditation. Um, and uh, you know, a full decade reading in, in religious traditions, East and West, uh, decided to go back to school to do a PhD in what ultimately became neuroscience. I, 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 I thought I would do a PhD in philosophy, but then I kind of got sick of hearing the philosophers wait around for the, the results from neuroscience labs when, when the conversation turned to the topic of consciousness and the nature of the mind, which is really the center of my interest. So. I was in the middle of doing a PhD in neuroscience, actually studying belief at the level of the brain using fMRI, functional magnetic resonance imaging to study human beings believing or disbelieving various propositions. <coughs> and uh, then people started flying planes into our buildings on the basis of really explicitly held religious beliefs. Uh, so my, my career as a writer, really the first few books is what 9-11 did to my intellectual life, essentially. It kind of preempted my, my research in, in um, uh, neuroscience. And I was AWOL for a couple of years. I wrote The End of Faith. I wrote Letter to a Christian Nation, which was my pushback against the Christian pushback to The End of Faith. But uh, many people have noticed uh, over the last, since I've been criticizing religion, that I have been, I've had a special focus on Islam. And one, one thing that has been somewhat unique about my atheism, though I never really, I never identified myself as an atheist when I wrote The End of Faith, uh, was that I, I believe religion is a word like sports. We, it's, it's just a suitcase term that names a very diverse range of behaviors and commitments. And just as you can't talk about tie boxing and badminton in the same vein and say anything really useful, I don't think talking about religion in general or opposing religion in general makes a lot of sense. I think we have to talk about the specific consequences of specific beliefs and uh, I don't think I'm alone in worrying that there are specific beliefs within the tradition of Islam that are uniquely uh, powerful and mobilizing and divisive at this moment. And we're, we're not up here to talk about the Methodists or the Mormons mm. or the Jains uh, or the Quakers. And you can extend that list rather far. And there's, there are reasons for that. And they're not just uh, born of the misadventures of the US in Muslim lands. Uh, there are theological reasons, there are historical reasons. And so I, I've been 
riding this hobby horse for a while and then uh, met Majid in a really inopportune context that we describe in the book at the beginning. Uh, it was actually at a, a debate that uh, he did against uh, my friend Ayan, uh, Ayan Hirsi Ali, who's here. Um, and uh, we uh, had a meeting that was really brief and unpleasant and <laughs> did not seem the basis for any further collaboration, but... C can I just say I met my wife through Aeon's event as well, so, uh, so that was uh, a lot more pleasant uh, uh, yes. than meeting Sam on that day. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm glad, I'm glad something worked out that <laughs> night. <laughs> Unfortunately, she isn't here, but... Uh, so in any case, it really did not, I, I was surprised, I kind of engineered this, this conversation with, with Majid that I thought was initially going to be just a blog post. Um, I got on the phone with him and we just, just rolled tape and just watched what happened. And we started having such a productive dialogue that I thought we really should write a short book. And he's really, it's been a pleasure to collaborate with him. Um, and the, the liberal or regressive liberal pushback against our effort that I'm no doubt we'll talk about uh, has really been amazingly cynical and ugly. And you know, there are people, uh, I don't know if we should name these people or not, I'll let uh, Maja decide, but you know, he, one person uh, on Twitter who has some platform uh, uh, called Maja my lapdog. He, 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 he talked about what an obscenity it is that a white non-Muslim like me would W would think that he could write a book about how to reform Islam. And then when someone pointed out that I had a co-author on this book, Majid, he called Majid my, my lapdog. Well, if you read the book, you'll see that if anything, my views and my way of speaking about this problem has, have been more modified than Majid's by our, our collaboration. Uh, so it's a, uh, it's a very interesting context in which we're, we're having this conversation. So based off of the substance of the book, let's just begin with whether um, what is Islam? Because you raise this, a, a particular question at the beginning of the book. Is it a religion of war or peace? And there's mm. one narrative, which is it's been hijacked by you know, radicals and extremists who are purporting to be of a certain faith and acting in ways that we all see on the front pages of the newspaper. Uh, but there's another way of thinking about it, which mm. is that it, th what we're seeing or what people are saying is at the core of the religion. So I'll ask you bluntly what you ask in the book, which is, is Islam a religion of war or peace? Uh, well, I'll take the first whack at that. I, I think uh, I mean, we have different instincts, I think, Majid and I here, and my instincts for many conversations now are to defer to his instincts, because I, I think I had no interest in winning the debate for atheism against religion in my conversation with Majid. I'm not, I was not trying to convince him that there is no God or that it's illegitimate intellectually to think that the Quran is a, uh, in some sense, a divinely inspired book. That's not uh, my purpose, and though I, I still hold, hold those views, um, the real purpose of our collaboration is to figure out some path forward, politically and intellectually and ethically, to arrive at a, a future where we're not seeing the kind of mayhem and callousness and divisiveness born of, of uh, religious differences. And so, you know, but Maja takes the line uh, in the book that it's neither a religion of war nor a religion of peace, it's a religion. And, and all religions have their, their toxic and their benign aspects. And it really depends on just what you emphasize. Uh, I'm a little more, a bit, I think if you, if you just catch Majid at that moment, if that's all he says, what he's saying is indistinguishable from many apologists who are actually playing hide the ball with the, the articles of faith here. People like Reza Aslan and people, people who are well known to just dodge the matter and who think that it is tantamount to bigotry to single out Islam for any special attention at this moment in history. Um, but Manja doesn't stop there, and that's why I, I had such a productive conversation with him. He admits that there's a link between specific ideas and specific behaviors. And so I think, I think uh, Islam has some specific ideas that are really problematic, which we discuss in the book, the specifically a belief in martyrdom uh, and a belief in jihad as, as uh, 
uh, incumbent upon any uh, Muslim, certainly any Muslim male, in defense of the faith, and um, and a certainty of paradise. Uh, I mean, these are. This is a a little little um, dark jewel of of uh, uh, religious demagoguery that I think we have to figure out some way to uh, uh, destroy intellectually. Uh, e and um, uh, you know, the, the, this conversation is, is I think, the basis of, of a way forward I in that direction. So uh, on the same question, but I want to touch on something Sam said earlier about <laughs> this notion that any Muslim engaging in dialogue with a critic of Islam, with, uh, with an atheist, with somebody like Sam or, or Ayan, uh, is necessarily uh, either a sellout, an Uncle Tom, a native informant, uh, or any of the above. Yesterday, uh, by a non-Muslim, left-wing, uh, white, uh, and particularly silver-spooned critic, I was called an Islamophobe. I want to address this head-on before we proceed, if I may, because I think it's disgusting to delegitimize my voice in that way. Um, and what I would like to say to them, and I hope they're listening, is the day that you have had to dodge neo-Nazi hammer attacks um, on the streets of Essex, as I have, the day that you've been arrested at gunpoint and profiled by police at the age of 15, as I have, the day that you've had, um, forcibly had your DNA taken from you and profiled at airports, as I have, uh, and the day that you face the grip of a torturer in Egypt's dungeons because of your Islamist political views, as I have, is the day you get to talk to me about Islamophobia. Um, the day you were born to Muslim parents, are a Muslim yourself and have a Muslim child, is the day you get to talk to me about anti-Muslim bigotry. Until that day, being a non-Muslim, uh, and particularly being a white male, to speak to me and to police my conversation about my own religion and its future in this world, and to choose for me who I'm allowed to speak to, is a form of colonial patronage that I could do without. It's a reverse form of racism. It's a policing of the conversation. It, it's born of a racism of low expectations because it assumes that the only good, it's the true good Muslim, bad Muslim game, by the way, because it assumes the only good Muslim is the angry Muslim. And there happens to be a bit of a brain malfunction in the heads of these people who assume that despite the fact I've been through all of that, I'm not sitting here in front of you ranting and raving and spitting and frothing at the mouth. Therefore, because I'm not angry, somehow I'm not the good Muslim. It's, it's patronizing in the extreme. And in particular, as I said, the two people who have named, uh, Sam's, I think mentioned one of them, the two people who have called me a native informant or an Uncle Tom or an Islamophobe, both happen to be non-Muslim, white, middle-class American males who haven't seen any of what I've just described. And I think they need to just stop and check their privilege, first of all. Um, and, and it's it's sad that the debate has got to this. Um, to, to very quickly answer your question, um, therefore, I have a right to have a view on that question. And that question, whether Islam is a religion of peace or a religion of war, for some Muslims, it's a religion of war. For the vast majority of Muslims today, it's a religion of peace. Uh, just like for the U.S., for, for, for Americans, the, for, for some Americans, the U.S. Constitution supports the right to uh, abortion, and for others, it doesn't. The same document, the same text is the subject of, 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 of dispute and, and fierce dispute in this instance. And one of the things that we discuss in this dialogue is that actually if Islam is only what Muslims make it through the process of ijtihad or interpretation, if the vast majority of Muslims today are not jihadists, then only because that's what Muslims are interpreting it to be, today it happens to be by majority rule a religion of peace. But that's not to say that there is an incredibly vocal, and disproportionately prominent minority within our own communities of Muslims who subscribe to the view not only that it's a religion of jihad and war, but are actually fighting and engaged in that war. And it's that vocal and organized, highly organized minority as represented by ISIS, in some instances they're controlling countries, that we must challenge head on and accept the fact they exist and not obfuscate and bury our heads in the sand and pretend that this isn't really a problem. So just to pick up on this, because both of your answers, the, both the first part um, which is helpful for people to hear, and the second part are related in the sense that this colonial patronage, or what you both so adequately call in the book the Voldemort effect, that our, our inability to actually say the name, which is it is not 
extremism, it is Islamic extremism, and you both criticize, or at least you criticize the Obama administration um, about its failure to sort of use the language or admit what it is. Uh, but confronting the ideology uh, is challenging because the ideology isn't just, you know, the ideology is big. There's different concentric circles, as you describe, of people who believe in certain parts of the ideology or certain parts of the religion. So how do you get people to actually talk about the ideology and begin to reform it or rethink it or become nonviolent if we're also afraid to even say, this isn't extremism, it's Islamic extremism? Yeah, I mean, the, the, I read all the Harry Potter books in, in prison. And, um, <laughs> and, uh, it's where I got that, that, that analogy from for the Voldemort effect. And I, yeah, I've, I've told J.K. Rowling this, and actually she's not, I'm not sure how pleased she is that we're applying it to Islamist extremism. <laughs> but effectively what it means for those of you who, and I hope everyone's read the books, those of you who haven't read those books, um, there's a bad guy in, in the Harry Potter books called Voldemort that, that people first, the two things. First of all, they deny he exists. And they're also, while denying that he exists, because he's meant to be dead, but he actually isn't really dead. The second thing is they're too scared to name him. So instead, what they say is, he who must not be named is dead. Now, I took that and said, look, that Voldemort effect, being too scared, too petrified to name the problem when actually it's staring at you in the face, is what's happened with Islamist extremism. And uh, the problem is we have been unable to name the problem, mm -hmm. led from, by President Obama himself all the way down. Whereas actually recently, Pr Prime Minister Cameron, uh, not least because we've been working through Quilliam very hard to advise him on this, but among many others, has named the Islamist ideology just last month in his speech and his intervention on this debate. I'm hoping the next president of the US does the same. What's the problem with not being able to name the problem? There are two problems here. Uh, external to Muslims and within Muslim communities. Uh, if we can't name Islamist extremism and we just say the, 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 the ideology of extremism, the problem is that outside of Muslim communities, many, many non-Muslims will assume you're talking about Islam, the religion itself, and all Muslims. That's the first problem, because by not naming it, you're increasing, you're blurring those lines and you're increasing uh, the obfuscation. And trust me, there are a whole bunch of nut jobs out there who would take delight, who would take pleasure in stigmatizing every single Muslim, which Sam doesn't do, nor does Aon. They don't do that. I've personally spoken to both of them about this, and in many instances watch their speeches. But there are plenty of people out there that would like to do this. So that's danger number one. By not naming it and isolating it from the religion, you're blurring those lines and making it easier for people to blame every single Muslim. The danger within Muslim communities is that by not naming the problem, we are disempowering the voices of those reforming Muslims who are attempting and struggling, who are vulnerable within their own communities and who are struggling to, uh, to, 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 to bring about that reform dialogue uh, within Muslim communities. We are disempowering their voices. Uh, we, are, we, are, uh, 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 we are not allowing them to make the case within the religion of Islam to say, the problem isn't Islam, fair enough, but there is something we have to address. And that something is this Islamist ideology that has hijacked our voice. But actually, by depriving them of that language, what are they left to say? How are they meant to have that debate? And instead, what happens is every gay Muslim, every feminist Muslim, every liberal Muslim, every dissenting voice is, is silenced, is shut down, is stigmatized, and, and those who shout the loudest are the ones dominating the discourse. And then we complain when mainstream society says, where are the moderates? We're not even giving them a lexicon to have this conversation. Mm. Sam, did you want to pick up on that? Yeah, well, I think we should be candid about how depressing the, the state of the conversation is around this conversation. Because, for instance, I think you at one point you said to me that you either expected or, in fact, were receiving more criticism from talk with regard to talking to me than talking to Islamists or even Absolutely. jihadists. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. That's, so he could go and talk to a failed suicide bomber, right? And everyone's and, happy. And everyone's, that's completely legitimate <laughs> use of his time, yeah. and of course we need to have conversations. <laughs> um, how else could we move forward? But talking to uh, famous atheists uh, over here, it, that is, it, that's as controversial as it gets. And there's, that is of a piece with this liberal uh, or pseudo-liberal criticism that both of us are, are getting on this topic, um, where people can't seem to see that, one, that we're talking about ideas and their consequences. And everything we say about Islam or Islamism or jihadism, or depending on what the focus is, conservative Islam, 
is, applies to white converts to the faith and it applies to people in a hundred different countries who, and a, a wide variety of ethnicities. Um, if ever I say something disparaging about Islam compared to Hinduism or Buddhism, well then that has nothing to do with racism or the colors of, of people's skin. I mean, this is, so racism and bigotry against people based on ethnicity or the country they're brought, I mean, that has nothing to do with any, with, uh, with uh, this conversation at all. And so this, this meme of Islamophobia that has been thrown up to prevent conversations of this kind is really quite destructive. Uh, and it's something that, I mean, the, the hypocrisy here should be just shattering to liberals in particular, because you have, uh, as Macha just said, we are abandoning the women and the free thinkers and the gays and the public intellectuals and the apostates in, the, these are the most vulnerable people on earth in Muslim societies where you have you know, atheist bloggers or e not even atheist bloggers, just secular bloggers. People at rape, by the way. Getting hacked yeah. to death. You know, um, uh, and liberals are not, not only not giving them any tools by which to better their lives, they are castigating the people who are trying to shine a light on this, the disproportionate nature of the problem here. It, you, it, to be gay or even a woman in a country like Afghanistan or Saudi Arabia or Bangladesh. I mean, these are these are these are unlucky places to be in in a uh, a minority of that kind, um, uh, and so it's a uh, uh, as we argue at some length in the book, liberalism has really failed us here, uh, and it's not. And you can you can criticize Christianity all you want, and liberals will never bat an eye. You can criticize Mormonism all you want, and uh, but the. Um, the moment you try to shine a light on the problem of, I think, you know, appropriately described as Islamism for, mm -hmm. for this conversation, uh, y just the, um, uh, the full armamentarium of political correctness and, and um, uh, cries of racism just hits you full in the face. And it's just, it is a thankless job. Nobody wants to do this. Nobody wants to have this conversation because it is so poisonous. Uh, especially on college campuses. And, well, and well, one of the movies. good things that's come from, for me, that's come from our dialogue, is that at least I'm, I'm, I'm sensing that the emphasis has shifted from one ab about the metaphysical conversation about whether God really exists or not, to the political and social values that we need for just and stable societies. And that's where I'd like to see the conversation go. Because I think the metaphysical conversation about whether God exists or not is less interesting yeah. to me. What's more interesting is that you can have the Church of England in the United Kingdom, but they won't be chopping people's heads off and they won't be lashing uh, people like Rafe Badawi just for writing a blog in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. And so if we can get to that stage, then we can have these conversations without fear of attack and, you know, uh, and, and lynch mobs are, uh, uh, you know, coming, coming to the door. So I'd like that emphasis, and I think this book leads to that. I don't know if you agree, Sam, but I think that what comes from this dialogue is that the emphasis is very clear and loud is on reasserting liberalism and civil liberties and human rights uh, that cut both ways, not just in favor of minority communities, but also in certain instances, minority communities have responsibilities to others, to mainstream society, to reciprocate those civil liberties in their interactions. And I think that's the focus that I'd like to continue through these dialogues with others, uh, to, to make it sort of a real focus on liberalism and values and ideas rather than whether God exists or not. But Sam, I think that's right, and the substance of the book gets into that, Sam, though you highlight in the book that the two basic tenets of, of Islam, it's uh, hatred or rejection of infidels and, and this notion of a post-earth paradise means that linking Islam with liberalism, right, with uh, gay rights, women's rights, whatever you want to call it, may be desirable, but it's essentially based on a pretense. It's essentially intellectually dishonest. Is that fair, or do you think that they are compatible? Well, uh, the path forward that Majid really <laughs> found in our conversation, and you'll, you'll see that it, it took some effort to uh, convince me to sort of follow him through that, you know, keyhole-sized uh, <laughs> aperture in this just wall of, yes. of uh, medieval ignorance, um, uh, <laughs> is that he, that basically that, that by the lights of Islam, there is no true Islam. There's no pope. There's no place to stand within Islam to say that your view of the faith is the truly canonical one. 
Uh, and so there is, a, there is a, a, a radical kind of pluralism there which reformers can take advantage of, where, where you can say, listen, this, this, whatever, you can be as doctrinaire as you want. You can be you know, right of Mullah Omar in terms of your, your theological commitments, but what you can't be is someone who thinks that that applies to all Muslims for all time. Um, now, I, I, I remain quite skeptical that we can have conversations with people of the you know, Mullah Omar sort. Uh, we're not going to have a dialogue with, with um, al-Baghdadi or, or the, the rest of uh, ISIS. But uh, as a general matter, uh, from Maj's side, that the way forward is to recognize that this pluralism demands a commitment to secularism. It demands, because there is no one version of Islam, you can't, uh, you have to keep your version uh, in this zero-sum contest with all these other versions mm -hmm. out of public policy and out of politics. And then that commitment to secularism can hopefully open a space for genuine liberalism and a genuine commitment to all these other values that we we want, which we don't, which aren't best expressed in any religion, frankly. They're mm -hmm. they're the result of a, a modern conversation about ethics and politics and human rights. Yeah, I, I think that's uh, you've just done a wonderful job summarizing my stance there. So I, I won't uh, repeat it, but I think it's important if you read the dialogue, you'll see that there are some surprising positions that traditional Islamic theologians have taken, which have been very literalist stances, but have led to very liberal outcomes. Uh, I'll just mention one. And, and I think it's important at this stage for me to say, look, I'm not a religious leader. I'm not even devout. I want to make that very clear. Some of you will see me, and you'll see me doing things that aren't typically devout. You know, I won't elaborate. But, but, uh, <laughs> but that's because I don't claim to be devout or religious. I am a Muslim who is not devout. Secondly, I don't speak on behalf of all Muslims. I'm not a leader for Muslims. I'm not a religious leader. I'm not a community representative. In fact, I find the whole concept of community representatives troubling and problematic. In particular, they tend to be aging men, graying men who are especially socially conservative, who deign to speak on behalf of everyone. So I don't subscribe to that model in the first place. So I don't want anyone to think what I say means all Muslims must think this. But that's part of the beauty, you see. That's exactly what I'm advocating, to open that debate up to pluralism. We have within Islamic history and theology a concept, because there's no clergy, as Sam mentioned, that if anybody subscribes to a religious injunction and they are correct, they get two rewards. Falahu ajran. And if they are incorrect, from an akhtaa falahu ajr. They still rewarded one. Because that process of re legal interpretation from the scripture is not wrong if you're legally qualified to do it. And the rest of the people, known as the awam, the followers, the muqallideen, those who follow a theologian, aren't judged for whichever option they choose. So there's one example I'll give you from the dialogue that I, that I mentioned uh, in, in discussion with Sam. And that is that the, uh, from the earliest exegesis of the Qur'an, from the earliest tafsir, uh, the Hanafi school of law, comes a man known as Abu Bakr al-Jassas, who was the first mufassir, or the first exeget of the Qur'an, to, to elaborate and explain upon its meanings. And he took a very literalist view of the word khamar in Arabic, which means, which is commonly translated today to mean alcohol. He took a very literalist approach to that word, and he didn't budge from its linguistic meaning, which was, and everyone concedes this point, by the way, that originally khamar only meant uh, grape wine, the wine from grapes. It doesn't mean whiskey, it doesn't mean gin, it doesn't mean beer, it only means the wine from grapes. And, and the, the early Hanafis, which was the first school of jurisprudence, I must emphasize, the closest in the times of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, say that therefore every other form of alcohol is legal apart from grape wine. Now that sounds like a particularly outrider position today when considering where the state of affairs are for, for, for the vast majority of Muslims who don't touch any form of alcohol. But I give this example not to take a position on it, but simply to emphasize something. And that is that that form of pluralism uh, that existed in those early years that has been lost because of the rise of both fundamentalism and Islamism, and I distinguish between the two in the dialogue, uh, the only way forward is for us to, to recognize that. And of course, relative to medieval periods, it may have been good, but actually there's a, lot, there's a lot in the medieval time that we don't want to reclaim. But we have to just recognize that exists because no one has the right to claim that they have the definitive view on any scripture, on any text. So the, 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 the logical conclusion from all of this can only be secularism because there's no pope in Islam. And that's essentially, in a nutshell, what I'm arguing in, that, in the dialogue with Sam and what I think, what I hope, that Sam has kind of recognized in, in what I'm saying as well. 
Najee, I know we have to go to questions soon. I want to ask you, though, um, about grievance mm -hmm. and what you hear. And I know there's no single spokesperson or whatever, but um, and violence. Because I think uh, from the perspective of people who are from the United States who see what's going on in the world, the linkages between uh, false, wrong linkages between the religion and the grievance that then leads to grievance of US policy, grievance of Iraq, grievance of Afghanistan, whatever it is, um, to then violence seems to be a straight line. So what do you say to the person who says, look, people can be you know, annoyed at the US for all sorts of reasons. Why is it only one religion that actually takes that grievance to violence and therefore requires all sorts of you know, policies by the United States for good or for bad, which then leads to a new level of grievances, yeah. which then leads to more violence. So, so just for those who aren't familiar with these debates, yeah. which, which in the policy circles, as you're very familiar with, are quite common, the question is whether radicalization is caused by foreign policy grievances, and therefore do we need to change our foreign policy, or is it caused by, say, ideology and something else entirely, and therefore we need to address ideology. And wh wh what I say is that um, human beings react to circumstances differently, we're not all the same. We're social animals. We're not like water. We don't all boil at 100 degrees Celsius, <clears throat> and we don't all freeze at zero. And so actually, the best way to explain this is it's, a, it's usually radicalization is, is due to a combination of factors. There are four factors I name in the dialogue with Sam. Uh, I talk about grievances having a role in that. If somebody's not angry, they're not going to look for an alternative form of discourse in the first place. So there, there needs to be an anger there. So there is a, uh, there's, a, there's an element that, that the grievances play a role. Then there's an identity crisis that comes about. Then there's a, a charismatic recruiter as a third factor. Mm -hmm. And the fourth is the role that the ideology plays. But this overly simplistic view that because I'm angry at US foreign policy, it means I'm going to blow something up, is, is a terrible, terrible uh, racism of low expectations of Muslims. Uh, it assumes that a brown uh, young Muslim man, uh, you know, because he can't handle his anger, is just going to blow something up. It's a terrible explanation for what's going on. And actually, Islam is promoted because they want US foreign policy to change. They tell us, all that, uh, tell us that all the time. Uh, uh, bin Laden's speeches were all about changing uh, policy towards the Middle East because he wanted to stop the support for Arab regimes so that he could overthrow them, as happened you know, eventually with the Arab uprising. So it's no surprise Islamists peddle this myth, but it's actually particularly worrying when those on my own political uh, uh, biases, the, the political center to center left, peddle this myth. Because the problem I, I have with it is the following. Look, I opposed the invasion of Iraq from a jail cell in Egypt. I've always been opposed to the uh, Bush Jr.-led invasion of Iraq. But what I can't do is say that that's the reason ISIS exists. Of course, there's a contributing factor. We can't say that it's got nothing to do with it. But what I can't say is that that's the reason, that's the cause. Because if you think about it, you follow that logic through, why on earth? are ISIS enslaving and raping Yazidi women en masse. What did these poor Yazidis do to anyone, anywhere? Which country did they invade? Or if you go to Afghanistan, look at the Taliban. You know, what is, what is forcing a man to grow a beard at the end of a lash of a whip, or forcing a woman to cover her face and, and her entire head, or stoning her to death because she's holding hands with the wrong person? What does any of that have to do with any invasion of any country? So there's something a bit more going on here, and it's too simplistic just to put all the blame on foreign policy mistakes. And of course, you know, uh, America, when it intervened in Kosovo to save the lives of Muslims, never got the credit for that. So this is a very simplistic worldview, and it needs to be challenged. Sam, picking up on uh, Maj's point, uh, for a well-known atheist, why are you engaging in this conversation? I mean, what, what is it that would be, let's say you were, I know you're not in politics, but that you would want to see change because of this conversation? Or is it just a good conversation to have? Well, I think this is the political and ethical problem of our time. I, I mean, in the, the largest, most generic sense, I think the, the contest between good ideas and bad ideas and the contest between good methodologies at, at arriving at, at ideas and bad ones, I think that is the, uh, the most important distinction to get right, both personally and, and, and uh, at the level of uh, societies. And um, religion at this moment has a monopoly on uh, 
being able to prom promulgate bad ideas without the usual collisions with clear thinking people uh, in the world. I mean, there, there, there's a taboo against criticizing bad thinking, um, illogical thinking, false claims to evidence, false claims to knowledge. And I think this has a, just a, a destabilizing effect on human cooperation in general, because I, all we have is, is a choice between conversation and violence when things really matter. And when you're telling me that there's certain things you know to be true, but you're, you, you, the way you know them is not based on any kind of publicly uh, available mode of evidence or reasoning, uh, and these things are not only non-negotiable, they're the most important principles in your life, this is intrinsically divisive, and this, this worries me across the board with all religion, but with certain religions, it, their commitments don't matter all that much. You know, the fact that Jains won't kill animals and are, are rather uh, dogmatic vegetarians, that's not a problem for anyone. And um, we're not going to see Jain terrorists insofar as they, they are, j and, and this, is, this is why fundamentalism is a, is a is a term of art and, and, and a red herring. The, fun the fundamentalism is not a problem if the fundamentals of your religion are totally benign. The, the crazier you get as a Jane, the less anyone has to worry about you. <laughs> uh, and that's, that is uh, rather obviously not true of Islam as a religion, uh, nor is it true of, of many other religions. But Islam has a few variables that we've just touched on briefly that are uniquely problematic. And I, I, if I could just touch on, on this notion of grievance that, that Maja just uh, discussed, I think we also have to admit that certain grievances really are just born of religion. They, they really are just theological. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if, you get, if you push back hard enough on the theology, discredit the theology, that is what you need to do to contain the, the, the risk born of these uh, grievances. And so drawing cartoons about the Prophet Muhammad. Right? Mm -hmm. now, you know, if I took out a piece of paper now and drew a cartoon, a stick figure, and said, this is Muhammad, it's not implausible to worry that the rest of my life will just be this deranged attempt not to be killed by some religious maniac who thinks I, who thinks I have crossed a the line there. Um, uh, there's only one religion on earth today that is doing that to people. And it is this is not based on US foreign policy. It's not based on anything mm -hmm. other than specific religious ideas. Uh, and that what, what liberals have, con where liberals have grown confused on this topic is they think there's some tension between free speech and freedom of religion, wh whereas there's not. There's, if, if your free exercise of your religion requires that I follow its precepts, that's not freedom of religion. That is theocracy. Mm. Right, so, so, and there's nothing I could say on this stage tonight that infringes upon anyone's freedom of religion. There's not, you, people have the political freedom to practice whatever faith they want in this country. And we all, as I just sane participants in a civil society, have to recognize that all of these religious ideas have to be, f be on the table to be criticized, mocked, satirized, uh, and that's, that's, that has to be the, the, the line between free speech and its erosion, that for me is, is, is the most crucial line to be very clear about. Yeah, what, what we say, what we say in the, well, there's a maxim that we use in the dialogue that no idea is above scrutiny and no people are beneath dignity. Just to uh, touch on the point Sam just made, scrutiny, uh, satire, uh, critique of any idea must necessarily be uh, not only allowed but actively encouraged. That doesn't mean that we pick on individual Muslim people. That's anti-Muslim bigotry. Let's put away the, the term Islamophobia. It's unhelpful because the term Islamophobia is used to silence the debate as it has been done with me by a non-Muslim, interestingly. But, but actually it's used to shut the debate down because actually it, what it does is it confuses the notion of critiquing any religion in this case, Islam as a religion, and picking on individual Muslim people. So for that, I use the, fr the phrase anti-Muslim bigotry, which is real and it exists, especially in Europe, with the rise of far-right parties across mm. the continent. It's real and it exists and it's a problem. But that, that's not the same thing as scrutinizing any religion, and in this instance, the religion of Islam. So no idea is above scrutiny. 
and no people are beneath dignity. If you want to, if you want to just imagine the line between those two, it's quite easy to imagine. There's a difference between Sam drawing a stick figure and holding up a stick figure and calling that uh, the Prophet Muhammad. I incidentally, I, I retweeted a stick figure of <laughs> of Jesus and Mo. Jesus saying hello and Mo saying how are you doing, and it was not offensive to me in any way. And I said Allahu Akbar minhu, which means God is greater than to take offense at this stick figure, right? And I got lots of death threats for it, but. The, the, the difference between that, which is focusing on the founder of one of the world's greatest religions, my religion, and between that and actually saying all Muslims are inherently uh, disease-ridden, rabies and you know, uh, uh, vermin in the continent of Europe, and we need to uh, cleanse Europe of them. That's a very, very different statement. And you know, sometimes we just, in our anger, irrational anger, we confound and confuse those two. I was uh, on the way preparing for this. Uh, this dialogue today, I was in the gym, working out, <laughs> and in walks Sam, actually it's the first time I'd seen him for a long time, and I'm in the gym, and he surprises me, he appears in front of me, so I look at him, I think, oh my god, I feel like a bit like Apollo and Rocky here, you know, so it's, yeah. <laughs> Apollo lost, so you can be Apollo, but <laughs> what happens is I'm in the middle of training, and Sam pulls his headphones out and says, you can tell them that I'm listening to Nusrat Fatih Ali Khan. <laughs> now, for those of you who don't know, Nusrat Fatih Ali Khan is a very great uh, and late uh, Pakistani Sufi mystic singer, uh, respected across the world by some of the best musicians, including the Beatles, who had great reverence for his music. And he's a Sufi leader in Pakistan. I happen to have him on, on my iPhone as well. <laughs> but the reason I mention that is his Sam Harris, who's often accused of anti-Muslim bigotry. Uh, let's put aside the fact that who on earth trains to Sufi mystical yeah. music in the first place? <laughs> <right? laughs> I mean, there's me with techno dance going <laughs> whoosh, 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 in my head while I'm trying to lift these weights. And he's listening to very, very calming, soothing Sufi Muslim music while he's, while he's training. But putting that aside, you know, here's a man who's often accused of anti-Muslim bigotry listening to Sufi music. Now, that's because he understands the difference between scrutinizing an idea and having or harboring anti-Muslim bigotry as a person. And if he didn't understand that idea, he would not be listening to one of the greatest Sufi uh, mystics and musicians that Pakistan has ever produced. Instead, he'd be boycotting that man because he's a Muslim. And I think it's important just to emphasize that point and make that distinction. On that note, I'm going to open up the microphones uh, to whomever wants to ask a question with an emphasis on question. Uh, please identify yourself and ask a quick question of one or both of the panelists uh, so that we can continue the dialogue. You can go ahead first, sir. Thank you. And thank you, Majid and Sam. Thank you both. Thank you. I thank should you. do that first. Thank you. And to say that we literally got through about 10% of the depth and sensitivity and creativity of the book is an understatement. So uh, stay tuned. Hi. Uh, thank you both. My name is uh, Zuhair Mazouz. I'm an Arab journalist. I wanted to uh, say very frankly that I liked Mr. Nawaz's uh, analogy between the debate happening in the Middle East, North Africa, and the one happening in the United States. You used the Quran to describe um, the debate happening in the Middle East, North Africa about governance, and then in the United States you used the US Constitution. And that to me is very symbolic of how far off these two regions of the world are from each other. These are not two types, in my opinion, these are not two types of government. These are two levels. Um, when we ask whether Islam is a religion of war or of peace, my answer usually is that it does not matter. If you ask that question about Christianity in the United States, it won't matter because you live in a society that protects thought, freedom of religion, freedom of choice, freedom of conscience. And the dream of us, our dream in the Arab world is to reach that level where we can actually not care whether any religion is a religion of peace or war because we are in a place that is governed by rule of law, freedom of choice, free speech, all these universal human rights. Which is why I have a big problem with the term Muslim world. You ask a question now. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. That's okay. 
Yeah, so that's, that, was, that was my question. <laughs> Do you think we should keep using that term or uh, is it more convenient because it's simple for the rest of the world to understand us? Thank you. Okay, so may your kind multiply. I, I really, really hope that lots of young Arabs like you s speak in the way that you, that you just did. And it's, it's incredibly encouraging to hear you say that. I agree with everything you said. Um, I, if you notice in my, uh, in my responses to the questions, I don't say Muslim country, mm -hmm. and I certainly don't say Muslim world. I say Muslim majority countries. To take Egypt as an example, 20% mm -hmm. of Egypt's population are Coptic Christian. So it's not a Muslim country. It's a country for Egyptians. If we're discussing uh, having a religious discussion, then that's why I'll say Muslim majority, because that 80% is a majority, but it's unfair on the minorities to call it a Muslim country. It should be a secular republic. Uh, secular in the American, not the French sense of the word. Um, so, so no, I don't use the word Muslim world either, because it unfairly homogenizes 1.6 billion people and assumes that they all think the same, both in religion and in politics. And in fact, they probably disagree more with each other over religion and politics than, uh, than Europe and America do. So it's, it's an unfair homogenization, and I thank you for your intervention. Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan Topaz, I'm at the law school. Um, I just had a question, I was recalling earlier in the day a uh, United Nations report that uh, was describing the democracy deficit in the Arab world, and that report from maybe five years ago basically was running regressions in whatever they were sh saying and said that the problem in the Arab world in terms of the democracy deficit, so to speak, has very little to do with Islam and has much to do with political, economic, social factors, institutions in the Arab world. And the fact that these countries are Muslim majority has very little to do with it. I'm curious why um, when you're speaking um, about illiberalism, values towards women, uh, things of that nature, uh, you, uh, why you believe that the isolating factor is in fact uh, the Muslim religion as opposed to some of those other factors that have driven, uh, you know, illiberal societies there. Thank you. Same. Was that for me or Majid? Um, whomever. I, I happen to know because I've known that you yeah. have spoken about that a, a few w times. We can give yeah. Apollo Creed a time. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I, I think the, again, it, it comes down to specific ideas and their specific consequences. So uh, yeah, there are other variables in play on many of these questions, but when you ask, you know, why, just let me take the, the most illiberal example we have currently, why is the Islamic State doing the specific things they're doing? Why are they throwing gays off of roof to rooftops? Why are they crucifying people? You know, why are they taking sex slaves? Uh, this is, you can draw a straight line from those specific practices. I mean, it's exactly like asking why do Catholics eat a cracker uh, it, during the the, uh, uh, the mass, you know, and, and, and say something about the, the miracle of transubstantiation. I mean, it's, it, is, it is doctrine in practice. And uh, I'm not discounting that, that poverty and lack of opportunity and being beleaguered by, by neighbors uh, who are stealing your resources. or I mean, this, this, all, this deranges people in kind of a generic way. But the, um, uh, there, there are specific versions of Islam, uh, the, 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 the political version we call Islamism for the purposes of this book, and I think that's the, uh, it's a very useful term going forward, which uh, are a kind of recipe for uh, intolerance and uh, in its various forms, whether it's intolerance towards women or gays or free speech or civil society as we know it. And um, it is separable from the other conditions on the ground. You can be very wealthy. I mean, it, it, so by your analysis, it is an absolute mystery why a, someone getting his medical degree in the UK, a third generation British citizen, would go off to join ISIS and think it's the best use of his time to go saw the heads off of journalists and aid workers, right? And, to, and just to realize that the sawing the heads off of journalists and aid, work, aid workers, that's not their My Lai massacre over there. That's not the what some 
specific individuals did in extremis and then had to apologize for to their culture, that is their, their outreach to the rest of the community. That is, their, that is their effort to put their best theological foot forward to the rest of the world. And some number of people find that incredibly attractive. And it's not an accident because you can go back to the texts and cash out those behaviors. And that's, that's the problem we have to be honest about and deal with. And, and that's, um, you know, you can, th th there's, there's a time and place not to spell it out in all of its gory reality. And, and uh, you know, so I, I, and I'm not a diplomat, I'm not a, I'm not a politician, and I never will be, and there's probably uh, obvious reasons for that. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, it, it's just, it's not purely a matter of politics and economics. Though it includes that as well. Yes. Includes, yes. Yeah. Oh, no. It includes yeah. politics and economics Absolutely. too. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Samir Shaibi, and I'm a student here at HKS. Um, so I have a, I have a question that kind of stems from a couple of comments you made tonight. Um, have you looked at either through conversation or within the book at the at the premise of self critique or assess, a reassessment of the religion from within the uh, uh, I guess the Muslim community. So my that question basically stems from one comment you you you, you made on um, on uh, 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 has a has an answer to the very very first question that has been asked whether uh, whether Islam is a region of peace of war. You said there is martyrdom is very is very much part of of, yeah. of Islam, but I, I feel also that uh, caveat here because I'm Muslim. <laughs> uh, the religion can uh, give us the tool of um, doing that self-critique. Uh, in the Quran, there is mentions of martyrdom being a lesser form of jihad, because uh, Islam is, is very much a, um, a region of self-struggle first, mm. and martyrdom and going to do jihad is kind of a last resort kind of choice. And the other thing is that, uh, the other comment that kind of stem that question is the uh, thing you said around um, rights of women, gay rights, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think um, it w when it comes to women, uh, I think we should make a difference between what, what the religion say and what the cultural aspects of certain society push people to do so. And I, I'm not sure whether you make that kind of a difference within the book between what cultural aspects and religious aspects kind of to those societies. Yeah, a little bit, we don't really go into much detail on that particular point, but I, I certainly acknowledge the those differences, and there are there, there's kind of a spectrum of of effects. There's there's you know what's in the Quran, there's what's in the Hadith, the, the larger literature that recounts the the sayings of the Prophet, and then there's the rest of culture that has been accreted around these texts. And yes, there you know certain things are just excruciatingly clearly spelled out in scripture and certain other things are just inferred by you know association with what's there and then certain things are, are just a matter of culture and I, I think it's it matters however that scripture and it's not just the Quran this is also this is most scripture uh, it matters that these texts are ethically speaking not the wisest books we have and it matters that most human beings think they were dictated by the creator of the universe. I mean, it, you could improve the Quran and you could improve the Bible in five minutes to the benefit of everybody. And yet we can't rewrite these pages, so we're, we're stuck with we're figuring out how to convince billions of people to interpret them in the most benign way. But if, if, if every page of the Quran had on the bottom of it a little footnote saying, oh, by the way, you know, don't kill anyone for their beliefs, you know, don't, you know, and, and homosexuals just fine, don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> and women are the equals of men, despite what I seem to have said in these other surahs, women are every bit the equals of men. Um, we would live in a better world. Muslims would live in a better world. And it's hard, it, because the Quran doesn't say anything like that, and because the Quran gives you a very plausible rationale for viewing women as the property of men, more than truly their equals. Uh, Muslims are left trying to, to, to do some very acrobatic theology 
on that point, and they have to do that acrobatic th theology, and Majid I'm, uh, is convinced that they have the tools to do that, and I think you're convinced that they have the tools to do that, but it would be a hell of a lot easier if somebody with 21st century values could just write a, a really good page in the Quran and <laughs> slip it in there. So <laughs> on this point, on this point um, thank you for your intervention. Um, and if I'd like to say something on this yeah. as well. Um, uh, so, so personally, for historical, we, we also address whether the Qur'an should be censored or changed in the dialogue. And we both end up agreeing that for both historical and pragmatic reasons, actually, it's a, an absurd idea. Uh, you know, you want to preserve a historical document as it is. You don't want to start editing historical documents and pretending they never existed because they have value in and of themselves. And that's me speaking just through a secular lens. Um, but uh, at the same time, uh, Muslims, and I'm really glad with what you said and the way that you view your faith, but unfortunately, there are many, many others who don't, and they're causing some problems in the world today. So I think we have to, com we have to confront that head on. And though we, uh, though we know that lots and lots of people think like you and me, uh, we also have to be honest and acknowledge that others, uh, when they see passages in the Quran, such as, as wa eidihima, the male and female thief cut off their hands, or azani wa zaniyatu fajliruhuma mi'ta jalda, uh, the the uh, fornicators lash them a hundred lashes, or so on and so forth. That are passages directly from the Quran. That there are people out there that take these, not just individuals. There are regimes that take these passages vacuously and enforce them upon the rest of society. Saudi Arabia is one such example. It still beheads people. It still cuts off hands, albeit surgically, uh, for theft, and it still lashes people for blogs. As I mentioned, Rafe Badawi, who's being lashed as we speak. So there are entire regimes, and there are groups such as ISIS who follow that vacuous interpretation of what they literally find within the passages. And I think it's incredibly helpful if Muslims like you and me own that, are honest about it, say, yes, there's a challenge we have here, and let's open up that debate. One of the things I mentioned in, uh, in this dialogue with Sam is that how historically uh, people uh, have got around some of these issues. The, the last uh, ever legitimate caliphate for Muslims, you will know, was the Uthmani Khilafah, the Ottoman caliphate, the Ottomans, took these passages known as the Hudud laws, the penal codes, and the Sheikh of Islam of the Ottoman Caliphate, the leader of the Ottoman Caliphate's theological reasoning, came along and said, through religious reasoning, he said, we're not going to use this anymore, and he adopted the French penal code instead. And that was done in a caliphate by the Sheikh of Islam. Right? So there have been attempts to reconcile this, um, but today, sadly, due to the rise, the very modern rise of Islamism and fundamentalism, which have been rising side by side. Perhaps I should just distinguish. Islamism, for me, is the desire to enforce any version of Islam over society. Fundamentalism, or, con or, or incredibly conservative religious practice in a Muslim context, is those who are incredibly rigid and socially conservative and regressive in their practices, even if they don't want to enforce those on others. Both phenomena, both phenomena have been rising. You know, the Saudi form of Salafism has been rising, and Islamism has been rising. And they're competing with each other for Muslim attentions. We've got to be honest and challenge that head on. And I wish, I really do wish, more Muslims were as vocal about this challenge as they are unfortunately vocal about irrelevant things such as people in Europe depicting cartoons, which frankly shouldn't hurt God, it doesn't hurt God, it doesn't hurt you or me or the Prophet, it shouldn't hurt anyone because it's a cartoon. But we'd rather burn buildings and, and, and kill people over that in Muslim-majority countries like Afghanistan and Pakistan, where they're killing each other over cartoons thousands of miles away than focusing their attentions on the self-scrutiny that you very correctly uh, uh, mentioned. They should be looking at their own societies and, and how to improve them. Thank you. So we are um, going past the allotted time, so I want to make sure, uh, uh, until I get the hippo, I'm looking over there. How about two more? And then, OK, so you and then you were the first. And I apologize to Thank everyone. You about this, but lots of questions. Go ahead. Uh, hi there, my name is Connor Riley, and I'm a junior at the college. Uh, and my question is for Apollo, but Rocky, you are welcome to hit me too if you are so <laughs> stuck. stuck. I forgot who I am, uh, uh, I'm Apollo? Okay. Yeah, I, I guess that's what we went with. So uh, towards the beginning of, of the talk, you made a really interesting point about destroying an idea intellectually. Um, but this is actually like fairly easy to do, like with colleagues and with papers and time. like. On an intellectual level, like like defunding an idea is actually like not terribly difficult. But like it gets very difficult like when you're trying to do it culturally, and even more difficult when you're doing it 
on an individual level. Um, another example that isn't necessarily tied to Islam would be like global warming, right? There's overwhelming evidence from the scientific community that you know human behavior is affecting the climate, yet you're going to have a group of the population who will sit there and no matter how much you speak to them will say that this thing isn't happening. Um, so I guess my question for you, and, and maybe based on your experiences and based on conversations that you've had, is how, if, if you were having dinner with someone and you needed them to think a new idea that disaligned with something that was really salient to them, how would you structure a conversation space to get this person not, not necessarily to destroy this idea for themselves, but at least to think a new idea that might misalign with a belief they already have? Because like this, this, this is the problem. Like this is, this is something that is catastrophic yeah. that I can't get yeah. around. Well, it, it's, as you say, it's a, a huge challenge, yeah. but it, it can be done. I mean, I, I, you know, my, my inbox attests every day that it, it can be done. I, many people think that um, based on, I don't, I don't know if it was George Bernard Shaw or Mark Twain, or I think they've both alternately been credited with this quote, but you, you can't reason out of, uh, you can't reason somebody out of something they weren't reasoned into. But uh, you've practiced it a yeah, lot. Yeah, but it, that, that's just false. I mean, you, you, you can reason people out of their deeply held beliefs that they didn't reason themselves into, but they're just, they're just acquired with mother's milk, uh, or they've reasoned themselves into, and they can reason themselves out of it, and, you know, just based on some continued conversation. Uh, and do you I'm do that with questions, or you do that with stubbornness? Well, you, you, you do it w in, you do it by continuing the conversation. And you and as long as I mean this is the the crucial matter for me is can we talk about it? You know there are certain people who are saying listen we can't talk about it. You know if you say X Y and Z I'm just going to come and kill you. Right that's the that's the really clear line between the 21st century and 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 the 14th century. Right and we have to just we have to hold that line. And there are many many liberals far too many liberals on this campus and every other. And in every journal, like you know, but the, with with prime offenders like the Guardian and the Nation and um, uh, Salon, I mean, the, the, the people who will just who are just giving away our freedoms with both hands, uh, desperate to do it, and will condemn as a bigot anyone who who complains. And that's the so we have a we have a battle for civilization right here that has nothing to do with with. Uh, suicide bombers. It has to do with with people just, just totally losing the plot ethically and politically, um, and intellectually. But yeah, it's just it, you have to keep putting pressure on on uh, bad ideas because that's that's the thing about bad ideas. They they don't they don't respond well to pressure. They don't. They're, they're people have internal contradictions hmm. uh, in their lives that they uh, can notice. Uh, because they're, you know, do you do you think prayer works? Many people say yes, absolutely. I think prayer works, and, I, and then you say, okay, well, you know, we have a new airline where the, the pilots are just going to rely on prayer to land the planes. Uh, ticket tickets will be cheap, and you know, you can very you know, sign up. You know, um, who's going to sign up for that airline? If you if you if the, if the pilot comes over the PA system and tells you that he's convinced that prayer is all he needs to land this plane. You know, you're, you're just going to see just stark terror on the faces of even the most <laughs> religious people, uh, and so that's a that's a contradiction that can be pointed out, uh, and there are th uh, we have to do that a thousandfold uh, and just keep doing it. But as you say, you know, global warming, evolution these are these are the jury is not out on qu questions, and many people just don't subscribe, and that's just it's a failure of conversation ultimately. I want to thank this young man for seating the microphone over and to you for a question because I, we wanted to get a diversity of questions as well. So thank you very much for your question, the last one. No pressure, right? <laughs> thank you again. Um, so my name is Rana Abdelhamid. I'm a student here from New York City. And I just wanted to go back to your point about just the anti-Islamic bigotry and hate crimes. So even though we can sit here and have a conversation about the difference between Islam, Islamism, and fundamentalism, oftentimes media does not necessarily distinguish between these things. And um, it's very easy for, like you said, right-wing groups to take these ideas and kind of de continue to dehumanize the image of what a Muslim is and um, creates 
you know, an increase in hate crimes, an increase in anti-Islamic bigotry. So I'm wondering what you would say to that mm. and how you're able to separate these things and have this conversation, especially within the Muslim community, um, when it's so hard to kind of fight that external battle as well. Thank you for your question. I recently wrote a column, I've just started the regular column for the Daily Beast, and uh, my last piece was actually on the rise of bigotry across the spectrum, and I cite a statistic which is incredibly worrying, and that's the London Metropolitan Police have said that anti-Muslim hate crimes have risen by 70% within a year in London. Anti-Semitic crimes have also gone up to the point where government ministers are giving speeches about how concerned they are with the rise of anti-Semitism. I think bigotry across the board, because, and I tie it directly, personally I tie it to identity politics and the rise of identity politics, people seeing themselves as part of their group and all others as the out-group, I think that leads to division and bigotry, but that's another conversation. But on your question, it's certainly a huge, huge issue in Europe. Um, um, pe communities are being divided along these lines and attacks are taking place against synagogues uh, across Europe. We saw um, some of those violent attacks where, where terrorists, once they finish attacking journalists, the very next place they go to is a synagogue yeah. you know, and start attacking Jewish people. Um, we're, on, we're speaking on Jewish New Year and it's, an, it's a huge, huge issue across Europe where in, in France, Jews in particular, for example, don't feel safe. And then likewise, as I said, in London, if anti-Muslim attacks have gone up by 70%, Women who look like you don't feel safe walking in the streets because they're worried about being attacked. And that could be my grandmother, who also wears a headscarf. So I can assure you that I have every, every concern and worry. As I said to those, to those uh, uh, non-Muslims who, who, who are trying to police my conversation in this, look, I have a Muslim child. I have Muslim parents. I have a Muslim grandmother who covers her head with a headscarf. I'm directly affected by the rise of anti-Muslim bigotry, and I'm a Muslim myself. And, so, and I've been attacked. I've been profiled. It's a huge concern. My only issue would be that the way to challenge this is to o throw open that conversation. I think the Voldemort effect, as it did in the Harry Potter books, and we'll run with that analogy, if we don't name the problem, it increases the hysteria, and which was one of the, 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 the genius uh, aspects of J.K. Rowling's usage of this device, of, of creating an enemy that we're too scared to name, because it only increases the hysteria. If you can't identify what you're worried about, you end up generalizing about everyone. And so why I push the term, you can go online, there's, a, there's a, um, a very polite and civil debate I had with Fareed Zakaria on CNN, on Anderson Cooper's show, about whether we should use the word Islamism or not. I like to think I did quite a good job, I mean, maybe Fareed Zakaria will disagree, but actually I, I elaborated on this point, that if we as Muslims don't isolate Islamism from Islam, and then define what we mean by Islamism, and say Islam by definition isn't definable, because it's a religion like any other, it has all the denominations and sects and interpretations and disputations that all other religions have. But Islamism is this thing here, and we define it as a desire to impose any version of Islam over society, and that's what we're worried about, that's what we're challenging. If that's a Muslim-led conversation, you will find eventually that that understanding spreads as it's done in this instance. I like to think that Sam's conversation around this has developed more nuance since we began our dialogue, and likewise I've developed, I've, you know, since discussing with Ayan and Sam on these issues, I've changed my views on, on many things. That's the beauty of conversation. And the, and the only other alternative to this uh, learning process that we all have to go through, and by the way, we'll make mistakes in the process as well. We will stumble and fumble our way through this. Sometimes I'll say something stupid, sometimes you will, uh, many times he can. Um, <laughs> but, but you know, by making these mistakes, we learn together. If our intentions are there to have this dialogue and get through it together, we'll make progress. The alternative is to shut the conversation down to muzzle people, to prevent them from speaking. And all that does, and I've seen this with my own life experience, is it increases the hysteria, the division, the enmity, and then people do start generalizing because they're not allowed to speak about it. So that's my take on that, um, but thank you. That's a great end. Yeah. Yeah. and Sam Harris, I want to thank you both. Thank you. Um, and thank you, audience, uh, for your listening. The book, once again, is Islam and the Future of Tolerance, a dialogue, Harvard University Press, in about two weeks as I look over at the editor and a nod. And thank you both very much you, for thank being you. here. It was excellent. Thank you. Thank you.